This morning we're in the book of Galatians. I'd like to read for you Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 26, a uh, very familiar passage I think you'll find, and uh, we'll actually be in Galatians 5 and actually in this text the, uh, the entire day. So let's go ahead and read it, Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. Uh, Would you listen carefully to this, again, remembering that this is not just something that some man wrote. A man did write it, but he did by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What we're reading is the Word of God. Paul writes this, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, And the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, Jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful. Challenging one another, envying one another. May the Lord bless His word to our understanding this morning. Now again, last week we saw that as a man, Jesus Christ was empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the work that He did. And that work had not only to do with the coming into the world to do what was necessary to remove your sins and to clothe you with His righteousness that you might be saved, but it was that He might also give you His Holy Spirit so that you might be able to do all that He calls you to do so that you would have the ability to move His kingdom forward. In other words, Jesus Christ came to give you not only salvation, but He also came to give you power. Now, this means that you can be powerful. You can be more powerful than you are now. I want to uh, remind you of the difference we saw that the Spirit makes when He comes on His people in His fullness. Fear turns to courage. Doubt turns to faith or confidence. Struggle turns to progress. Before the Spirit came, the disciples were running for cover when threatened, but afterwards, They had the boldness of lions. Now, not only can you have power, but the Lord actually commands you to have it. He says, be filled with the Spirit. And when you are filled with the Spirit, you will have strength. God tells you to do that because He wants you to be like His Son. He doesn't want you to be like Peter, who before the coming of the Holy Spirit wasn't really even able to find the courage to confess Jesus Christ before a servant girl because he was afraid for his life 
But of course, after the Spirit came, he boldly got up and proclaimed Christ not only before thousands of the Jews who just shortly before called out for Christ's crucifixion, but also before the leaders of Israel, knowing that his life was on the line. But don't forget as well, the fact that the Lord commands you to be filled with the Spirit means that there is something you must do. A command is something that must be yielded to. You must desire to be filled with the Spirit and with His power. You must seek to be filled with it. In other words, you know, try to be filled using the means, using the ways that the Lord has given to you. And of course, after gaining that power, you need to hold on to that power by turning from your sins. Now, before we leave this topic, I wanted us to look at two more things that have to do with the Spirit of God and having this power. I want us to understand, first of all, why you aren't perhaps as powerful as you might otherwise be in the Holy Spirit, and that has to do, of course, with the struggle that's going on in your heart, but also what you can do to overcome that obstacle so that you can become more powerful, what it means to walk in the Spirit of God. Now, this morning, we're going to consider the first point, why it is you are not as powerful as you might otherwise be in the Holy Spirit. And I want us to look at three things. First of all, the two desires that are in your heart. Secondly, the struggle that exists between them because they are opposing principles. And thirdly, the resulting weakness, why it is that you are hindered from doing what it is the Lord would have you to do or why you're not able to do all that you might desire. So first of all, let's look at the two desires. And again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I think we're very familiar. You know from your own experiences what those two desires are, even as I know all too well. One desire is a love for what God loves. And praise God that we have that desire. But the other desire, sadly, is a love for what God hates. Now, I know that a number of Christians may have difficulty with that particular concept. And some may even want to say the second desire doesn't really exist once you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And others would say that you can overcome it and become perfect. But I would ask you to point to just one Christian alive in the world today who is a perfect man, a perfect woman, a perfect child. You actually do love to a degree in your heart the things that the Lord hates. Otherwise, you would never choose to do those things, and all of us do choose to do things against God's will. Now, you also know where these two desires came from. You know that your love for what God hates came from your father, Adam. When he chose what God hated, when he disobeyed God at the tree of testing, God charged that sin not only to him, but he charged that sin to you, and that sin corrupted your heart. That's why you love evil. That's why you came into the world loving evil. And that is the way you would have remained unless God in His mercy had broken the power of that sin by His Spirit through the gospel. But God did break that power, and that's where the second desire comes in. And God did it in such a way that it wasn't forced, but rather He brought about our willful yielding and compliance to it. I just want to point out that God doesn't, you know, force you, as it were, into some kind of a, a restraints as though, you know, you exchange one set of chains for another. That's not the way the Lord does it. He doesn't force you to conform outwardly, but leaving your heart unchanged. He doesn't do it by threatening you with fire and with hell, with judgment, if you don't turn around. That's not how He gets your compliance, or at least that's not what the gospel does, although the Lord may very well have made you afraid through the threats of His judgments to show you your need that you might turn to His Son, but He didn't force you to love Him. He didn't force you to obey Him against your will. 
But what God did, He did in a very gracious way. God gave you His Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God opened your eyes to show you the way things really are, to show you the truth, to show you what you were blinded to before, to show you how beautiful He is, how glorious He is, how beautiful the way of salvation is through His Son, how gracious He was in giving His Son to you while you were still His enemies. He opened your eyes to, to show you how good His commandments are and how evil the sin that you were living in really is, so that you would want to turn away from your sins and trust in His Son and walk in His ways. You know, Jesus on one occasion was contrasting what God does with what the Pharisees do. The Pharisees like to uh, outwardly conform to what God wants them to do, but they don't conform inwardly. He says in Matthew 23, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish so that the outside may become clean also. The gospel is not about God putting you in restraints to reform you outwardly, but leaving you still in rebellion in your heart. It's all about the Lord's work in cleaning your heart so that your life would be transformed from the inside out. Now, if you're a believer this morning in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's why you have these two desires. You received one from your father, Adam, but you received the other from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ this morning, if you're not a believer this morning, you do need to understand that you only have one desire, and that desire is for sin. And you might be able to do what the Pharisees did. You might be able to clean up the outside. You might be able to fool other people into thinking that you're a believer, but you can't fool God. The only thing that pleases Him is the attitude of the heart. You have to love Him. You have to desire His glory as well as do what He commands in your actions. But in order to do this, you need the Spirit of God. He has to clean the inside of your heart out before you will be able to love the Father, before you'll be able to love the Son, before you're going to be able to trust Jesus Christ in order to save you. You can't do it on your own. You don't have the ability. There is nothing good in you, the Bible says, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't have His Spirit. So if you don't, that's where you need to start. You have only the one desire, you need the other, otherwise you can't trust the Lord. So ask the Father in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, to give you the Spirit. God is merciful. He's merciful to all who call upon Him in truth. And if you ask really desiring, the Lord will do it. As a matter of fact, if you can ask with that kind of desire, he already has. But again, for those of you who do have the Spirit of God, you know you have these two desires, and you also know this, that the work that God has done in your heart is only in part. It's only partial. It's not done yet. And it won't be finished until He brings you to heaven. But for that reason, you have a struggle that is going on inside of you. These two desires bring about warfare. One of these is pushing you continually towards sin and away from God. The other one is pushing you towards God and away from sin. I mean, just consider the list that Paul gives as he tells us the fruits of both. With regard to that which you inherited from Adam, that Flesh, that sinful corruption, he says this, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. This is not an exhaustive list, but there are many more things 
of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, I'll remind you what John says in 1 John, anyone who practices sin is not born of God. Anyone who practices sin is born of the devil. The one who practices righteousness is born of God. But I also want you to notice that isn't what Paul, you know, what he, what he describes here with regard to the nature of the flesh, isn't this a perfect description of the world? Isn't this a perfect description of what it is that is driving the world, of what the people of this world are really all about? I mean, what do you see when you look at the world and the people of the world? Don't you see them going after sexual desire? Isn't that what drives most of what's going on? Paul says the deeds of the flesh are immorality, impurity, and sensuality. They do this because they're fleshly. Don't you see the desire for possessions, for power, for position? Paul says the deeds of the flesh include idolatry. A covetous man is an idolater. Don't you see that some people, I mean, perhaps more people than used to, seeking some advantage in this world by seeking the devil or going through the occult? The deeds of the flesh, Paul says, include sorcery. And what about those who get in the way of the people of this world as they're pursuing their, their treasures, whether they be sexual objects or whether they be things that, that their lusts desire in other areas, again, such as power and possessions? Well, the deeds of the flesh include enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying. The desire to break the boundaries we see also in our culture as well as, you know, again, the, well, to, to set aside what we would call good conduct. And they want to cut loose. They don't want to live by societal restraints. They don't want to live by what is right. Paul says the deeds of the flesh include drunkenness and carousing. Now, again, as I look at the world, that's what I see because they are driven by this desire they inherited by Adam. Is it any wonder John warns us, do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The reason is because it is contrary to the Father and to everything that he loves. Now, if you know you, your own heart, you know all too well that these desires that Paul has mentioned here are in you as well. But thankfully, by God's grace, you are not bound to them. You don't have to submit to them because He has put another desire in your heart that is pushing against these. And those are the desires of the Spirit. Paul writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, what is it that Paul is describing here except the heart of your Savior? This is why Jesus Christ loved His Father. This is why He loved His kingdom and pursued His kingdom and did the things that built the kingdom up Rather than the world, he hated the world and he turned away from it. And this is why you struggle with the world because you have two desires in your heart and not just one. By the way, whenever you have any question about you know, what you desire, whether it falls into one category or the other, just read this list and see which one it's more consistent with, which one it actually fits into. But do be careful because your sin is deceptive. Remember, the Scripture talks about the deceitfulness of sin. It will convince you that what you want is actually good. Satan, as Thomas Brooks points out, love, loves to, to paint vice in the colors of virtue. So you think, or at least you convince yourself you're doing what's right, when as a matter of fact, you are doing what's wrong. 
So you have two desires. These two desires are opposites and are pushing you in opposite directions, and that's why you have the struggle that you do in your heart to do God's will. Now, finally, we look at the result of the two desires. Paul says, you may not do what you want. Now, I don't think Paul means here that you can't do what you want to do at all, that you can't obey at all, because Jesus came to free you from the bondage of sin so that you could obey, and he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I think what he means is that with these two desires constantly fighting against each other, that you're not going to be able to do what you want to do in the way that you want to do it, which as believers, we want to do it the way that Jesus did it. We want to live as Jesus lived. We want to live perfectly. We can't because we have these two struggles or these two desires. You have something that is standing in your way. Now, Jesus became a man like you and like me, but he was a man without sin. He was not like you, and he was not like me in that way. Jesus Christ, we're told, had the Spirit without measure, which means his soul, his heart was fully devoted to God and to his cause. He had no sin, nothing that was fighting against that devotion. But that is not the situation that we're in. You will not have that kind of perfection, the Bible says, until you arrive in heaven. And so until then, you will have a fight on your hands. Now, I don't know if you've ever asked the question. I mean, we recognize this is what the Bible says. This is what's true. Perfection is not possible in this world. It'd be nice if it were. It'd be nice if there was a second blessing of the Holy Spirit that would allow us to be perfect, give us a perfect heart. But that's not what the Bible bears out. Why did God do it this way? Why did He allow the sin to remain? Why do we have this struggle that is ongoing? Well, if you, um, if you know God, it's because of his, in His infinite wisdom, and His mercy and kindness. He intends some good to come out of it. And I think that it does actually bring about good. For one thing, the fact that we still carry about the desire to do things contrary to God's will should humble us and cause us never to trust in ourselves, but rather to trust in Jesus Christ, to depend upon Him and not upon the strength that we have and I think another important thing is this. We live in this world. God intends for us to continue in this world because there's a work that we have to do in this world, but God doesn't want us to make our home in this world. He wants us to set our eyes on some other place, the place that He actually intends to bring us after a while, and that is heaven. Now, if you didn't have this sin to contend with, perhaps you wouldn't desire heaven as much as you might otherwise. You might say the flies that are in the ointment that is in your heart are to remind you that this is not your final destination. Every time you wrestle with sin, every time you recognize that evil that's inside your heart and you cry out, Lord, would you free me from this? That should give you the desire to be with the Lord in heaven because that's the only place that you are actually going to be rid of it forever. But again, here is our dilemma. Here is our difficulty. This is why we can't be as spiritually powerful as we might otherwise be because we have two desires. The one by God's grace that, that is moving us towards God and the one which we inherited from our forefather, Adam, which is drawing us towards the world. Thankfully, that um, sin within us is broken, as we've already read about, as we've already seen. There's no condemnation because we have those desires within us. The old man is crucified, was put to death when Christ died on the cross. We have been raised to newness of life. The fact that we have this struggle doesn't mean that you can't become more like Jesus Christ. The Lord has actually made provision for us to overcome this flesh 
at least to a degree. What it means is you have to be careful to walk by the Spirit of God if you are not to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that is what we're going to be looking at this evening. So I would encourage you, if you're able uh, to return as we continue to worship, to know what we might do. And I really think that if we focus on what it is we're going to look at this evening, I really do believe that we can become much stronger than we are currently. And as Christians, that's what we want. We want to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do. The only thing standing in our way is ourselves. It is the old man. It is, the, it is that sinful nature. How can we defeat it? Well, that's what we're going to look at this evening. So I hope, again, you'll be able to return. But for now, let's bow in a moment of prayer. And let's ask the Lord to take what we have seen and to apply it as He would desire to apply it.